I'm Eric Olson. I'm really happy to be here today. I want to bring you up to, to date on what I think is the most revolutionary new technology in science and how we think we can apply it to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I'm fortunate to be joined today by two members of my laboratory, one here and one in the back, and they'll be happy to answer all the difficult questions. <laughs> so I have um, spent my entire adult life uh, working on diseases of muscle and trying to understand how muscle forms, how it functions, and how it dysfunctions. I just want to start by saying I'm really inspired, totally inspired by all of you and the Duchenne families, and I'm committed to uh, really dedicating myself to try to find a, a cure for this disorder. And I'm going to talk to you today about what's still very early research, but I think is uh, very promising, and I hope you uh, agree. So I'm going to talk to you about CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, and for those of you who have not heard about this technology, you will all hear about this technology. I was in an airport just two days ago looking for something to read on the plane, and this was the Newsweek magazine, and the, it was dedicated to this technology, Gene Genie. So this is a, an approach that I'm going to tell you about that enables us to identify even a single letter mutation in the DNA and to correct that mutation. So I want to talk about how we can apply this technology to Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a disease which all of you are deeply familiar with. As we heard earlier today, this disorder affects about 1 in 5,000 boys. There are 300,000 boys in the world afflicted with Duchenne uh, right now. And as you know, there is no permanent cure. There are many uh, therapeutic strategies being developed that can uh, diminish uh, the, the symptoms and delay the progression, but there is as yet no permanent cure for this disorder. The disease is caused by mutations in the largest gene in the human body. This is the gene encoding the protein dystrophin that we've heard about. This is a massive gene, it encompasses 2.6 million bases, so this is enormous. And I think most of you know that genes are divided into segments that are called exons, those are schematized here. And ultimately, the splicing of the exons together gives rise to the, the RNA that codes for the, the dystrophin protein. And there are 79 exons uh, in this gene that must be perfectly put together to make the, the final protein. And one of the challenges in this disease is that there are more than 3,000 different mutations that have been identified in boys around the world with DMD. Now this is the way that the disease is passed on from uh, parents to uh, their sons. The disease is caused by mutations in dystrophin on the X chromosome, and I think most of you know women have two X chromosomes. So if a woman has a mutation in, in one of her dystrophin genes and the other one is normal, she's asymptomatic. And when she uh, has children with her husband, she will transmit this mutation to 50% of the boys. And any boy that inherits the mutation will always develop the disease. There is no uh, avoiding that. Whereas 50% of the boys from this couple will have a normal X chromosome that uh, can come from, uh, from this mother. And then 50% of the daughters of this couple will be carriers, but they'll be asymptomatic because they have a, a second X chromosome. So to, to look a little more deeply at muscle and how it works, this is a schematic. So here's a cross section through a muscle fiber. And if you think about the muscle membrane, right beneath the membrane of every muscle in your body, all the skeletal muscle, all the heart muscle, lies the dystrophin protein schematized here. And essentially what this protein does is it stabilizes the muscle. If you think about your heart beating once per second for your entire life, that's a lot of stress and strain on each of those cells, and you think in all the muscles of your body, the muscles that enable you to stand upright, to walk, to run, to go upstairs, there's a lot of pressure and, and tension and stress on those muscles. The dystrophin protein maintains the integrity of the muscle membrane, and ultimately, if the dystrophin protein is lacking, the membranes begin to leak and uh, degenerate, and that causes muscular dystrophy. So if we look a little more closely, this is a cross-section through a muscle tissue and we've stained the dystrophin protein here in green, and you can see just below the membrane of every muscle fiber lies the dystrophin protein, and th there it lies to maintain the integrity of the membrane. 
And as we heard earlier, you can think about the dystrophin protein as a shock absorber for muscle. It just maintains the integrity of the fiber, and without it, the fibers uh, ultimately will disintegrate. So we've heard about exons today, and I want to say a bit more about them. As I mentioned, the dystrophin gene can be divided into 79 exons that are schematized here. And this is the dystrophin protein at the top without getting into too many details. If you think about it as a shock absorber, the two ends of the shock absorber are absolutely essential. The central region is like a spring, and it has many different uh, redundant uh, domains, and only a few of those are needed for the function of the shock absorber. And here you can see the exons that we've heard about so much today, and I've color-coded them here so you can see the different portions of the protein that are encoded by the different exons. And as we heard from Jack, the shapes of the exons indicate whether splicing between those exons maintains the production of the protein. As long as the shape of any two exons is compatible to fit together, the protein can be generated. But if there's a mutation that disrupts an exon so that the surrounding exons can't fit together, that leads to the absence of dystrophin and to the disease. So again, coming back to the shock absorber analogy, this is what the normal dystrophin protein would look like. And we know that the central portion of the spring is not entirely necessary for the function of the protein. And we know that because there's a large population of patients in the world with a mild form of muscular dystrophy called Becker's muscular dystrophy. These patients can live well into their 60s or 70s with relatively modest muscle uh, problems. And you can see why they develop this disorder. They have internal deletions that remove portions of the spring but the two ends of the shock absorber are still intact, so they still make a partially functional dystrophin. And it's been proposed that if we could convert DMD into BMD, it would be a clinical triumph, and that would enable these boys to live for decades longer. That, that really is the ultimate goal of our research, and I'm gonna tell you how we hope to do that. So the concept of exon skipping, just once again, here's how it works. Suppose you have these exons. This is, these are exons, the shapes of exons at one end of uh, the dystrophin gene. And suppose you have a mutation here that prevents the production of the protein. By exon skipping, one can skip over this, put the protein back in frame and reconnect it. So, how do we propose to do this? We believe we can do this using gene editing technology, or as I said, CRISPR-Cas9. So let me tell you a bit about how this works. In every cell of your body, you have three billion letters of DNA. That is a, a lot of letters. Every single cell has that. How many letters is three billion letters? Three billion letters is the number of letters in 1,000 Bibles. So that's a lot, a lot of letters, right, in every cell of your body. And what this gene editing technology enables us to do is to go into any cell and find one wrong letter, one misspelled word, and to correct it to the, to the normal letter. So this is really powerful technology. So here's how it works. Suppose you have a mutation in the dystrophin gene, one single letter and one exon that stops the production of dystrophin. We can use this technology, and I won't get into all the details, but suffice it to say that we can generate a short RNA strand, which we can introduce into a cell, and it will seek out in the three billion letters of DNA whatever target we direct it against, and then it'll bring an enzyme to that site and the enzyme will cut. I've shown that schematically here. And it will repair that mutation and convert it back to normal. So this, at least in principle, this represents a way to permanently cure a disease because the disease is caused by the mutation and this approach lets one identify the mutation and eradicate the mutation from the DNA of all the cells of the, of the potential patient. So coming back, to the dystrophin gene. The most common mutation in the world 
in boys with DMD, which we heard about today, the, the uh, Sarepta drug, Ateplersen, is uh, designed against this mutation. And this is a mutation in exon 50, in which this segment of the gene is deleted. So in this case, when you delete exon 50, exon 49 will splice to the next exon in line, which is exon 51. And you can see the shape is incompatible. So this boy cannot produce the rest of the dystrophin protein. He can't make the other end of the shock absorber, and so his muscles will degenerate. And so because he can't make this end of the shock absorber. All of the studies that have been done so far in Duchenne muscular dystrophy have been done in a, a mouse model, which we heard about earlier today, called the MDX mouse. But that mouse has a mutation that's not like the majority of the mutations that are found in boys. And so we, in our laboratory, we made what we would call humanized mice. We took mice and we put the mutations that are seen most commonly in boys into those mice so we can then use those mice as a platform to optimize new strategies for correcting the disease. So here we made a mouse that has an exon 50 deletion. This mouse has no dystrophin protein. This is again a cross section through muscle stained for dystrophin in red. There's no dystrophin. This is, so this mouse develops the disease just like a boy with an exon 50 deletion. Then we engineered into a harmless virus called AAV, adeno-associated virus, which we heard about today. We engineered into this virus the gene editing components for CRISPR-Cas so that we could skip exon 51 and put the protein back in frame. And we can do a single injection into this animal. And then we look three weeks later, and now you can see all these muscle fibers are now producing dystrophin protein. It's not quite perfect, but it's pretty good. And here's what normal muscle would look like in parallel. So this is, of course, this is just a mouse. This isn't a boy, but this is very encouraging what we would call proof of concept studies. The ultimate cause of death in patients with DMD is heart failure because the heart muscle, you know, is contracting every second of, of your life and ultimately the, the, long, the wear and tear on the muscle without dystrophin lead, leads to heart failure. And here you can see in this humanized mouse, it has no dystrophin staining in its heart compared to a normal. And here we did one injection of adeno-associated virus encoding the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing components and we looked four weeks later in the heart, and you can see the heart muscle cells are now all expressing dystrophin. So by a very simple gene correction of the actual mutation that causes the disease, the gene can now produce the missing protein in the whole animal. The protein goes to the right place in the cell, and it restores the function of the muscle tissue. And I won't get into all the biochemical details, but this is a a gel that shows the dystrophin protein because one of the key issues in developing a therapy for this disease is efficiency. How efficiently can you restore the production of the missing protein in, in these patients? So this shows two normal mice. This is the level of the dystrophin protein, a massive protein in the heart. Here's the humanized mouse. It has no dystrophin protein in either of these two uh, male mice. And here, following four weeks after we did a single injection of the gene editing components, you can see the protein is restored almost completely back to the normal level. So we're very encouraged by this. So how are we trying to take this work forward towards patients? So at UT Southwestern, we have a muscular dystrophy research center, and a patient can come in and we can identify, or others will identify, the mutation in that patient. And we can take a small sample of blood from the patient, and we can use that to create stem cells in a dish. So they're called IPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. And then we can test the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing components. We can introduce them into these cells. These are the cells that come from the boy who has the disease, and we can turn those cells in a dish into heart muscle cells or skeletal muscle cells, and we can then ask, can we restore the production of dystrophin protein from the actual cells with the genetic mutation in this boy. And we call this method myo-editing or muscle editing. So here's an example of how this works. This is a real boy. This boy has a mutation 
in the hotspot region for DMD. He's missing exons 48, 49, and 50. And so in this boy, his exon 47 splices to the next exon in line, that's exon 51, and you can see the shapes are incompatible, so he can't make any dystrophin protein. We looked at this and we said, if we could just do gene editing to skip exon 51, just, just as the Teplerson drug does, then we could skip from 47 to 52, and you can see the shapes are compatible then. So we direct CRISPR-Cas9 right there, and we skip the exon. So here's the result. So he, these are heart muscle cells that we generated from a small sample of blood from this boy in a dish and we stain them for dystrophin in red, and there's no dystrophin. This boy can't make any dystrophin. But by a single step of gene editing, we can convert these cells to this, and now dystrophin is re in red. And now this boy's cells, this boy never made dystrophin in his life, but now by one step of gene editing to correct the mutation, you can induce these cells to uh, form dystrophin. And here's what the protein looks like. Here's the dystrophin protein on a gel, and normal, in a normal uh, cells from a normal boy. Here's this boy, uncorrected. He can't make any dystrophin. And then we can correct his cells to produce normal levels of uh, dystrophin. So within the dystrophin gene, there are what are referred to as hot spots, and I think you're all familiar with those. And there are 12 hot spots. I've highlighted those here, these exons are the 12 hotspot mutations that account for between 60 and 80% of the 300,000 boys in the world that have Duchenne. So it's been predicted if you could skip these exons in the appropriate boy with the mutation in these regions that you could potentially cure up to 80% of, of these Duchenne boys. And so we developed optimized guide RNAs to deliver the gene editing components to each of these exons in the human genome, and we can now uh, correct. We've shown this in cells from all sorts of patients that we can correct uh, mutations in each of these exons. So what types of mutations can, in principle, be corrected by CRISPR-Cas gene editing? Nonsense mutations, that is, stop codon mutations can be corrected by skipping the exon that's mutant. And when you skip that exon, it corrects it, but it leaves one exon out. So this is converting DMD to BMD. It's a partial correction. It's a very effective correction, but it's not perfect. Deletions, such as the exon 50 deletion that we've heard so much about, can be corrected by exon skipping to put the surrounding exons back in frame. And this is a partial but effective correction. Duplications, we heard some questions today about duplications. We've worked a lot on duplications uh, in our laboratory. Duplications can, in principle, and we've shown this in cells from boys, can be perfectly corrected. So in those, you can delete just, you can skip just the deleted region, and when you do that, it puts the protein back in frame, and it's a perfect correction. And then there's another type of mutation called a pseudo-exon or a false exon. This is an insertional mutation that disrupts the protein. We can correct those and it makes a perfect scarless dystrophin protein exactly like the normal. However, there are mutations that cannot be fixed by CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And those represent perhaps about 20% of the mutations in the world. And these are mutations that delete either the essential, either of the essential ends of the shock absorber. If the segment of DNA that codes for that part of the shock absorber is completely deleted, you can't fix it by editing because it's, there's nothing there to fix. But fortunately, this is a relatively small number of patients, and those patients will benefit from many of, of the other types of therapies that are being developed, such as uh, microdystrophin therapy, and, and uh, dysflatus cord and, and the other types of uh, therapies that we've heard about today, myostatin inhibitors, et cetera. So lastly then, what are the distinguishing features of gene editing as compared to the many other types of therapies that are, are being developed? 
perhaps the most distinguishing feature is that at least in principle, this represents a permanent correction of a disease because it eliminates the cause of the disease, which is the mutation in the DNA, and it restores the DNA back to a state where it can produce the missing protein. In principle, it represents a one-time treatment because once the mutation is corrected, the cause of the disease is gone, and certainly we've shown uh, in mice that it is a one-time uh, treatment. Potentially, and this is an important point, it can potentially reach all the cells in the body that require this treatment. If you think about the muscle in your body, the muscle in your body accounts for 40% of your body weight. This is an enormous tissue. And the heart, of course, is, is uh, essential for life as well. But the virus that we've used, adeno-associated virus, is a, it's a harmless virus. It's already approved by, for use by the FDA in patients. But this virus, we use, I, I neglected to say this, we use a very specific form of this virus that selectively infects only muscle and heart. So if, when we introduce this into a mouse or if introduced into other animals, including people, that virus will deliver its cargo, in this case, the gene editing machinery, right to the muscle uh, and, and the heart. And it's very effective, as I showed you, with the correction of the humanized mice. And finally, it has the potential to correct up to 80% of the DMD uh, mutations, and we know that it can correct that, that percentage, certainly in cells derived from patients and in, in mice, and it remains to be seen whether it will work as effectively uh, in boys. So this is uh, my last slide. What I've told you today is that this is a game-changing technology. It was only first described in the scientific literature less than four years ago, and it has moved so fast now that there's biotechnology companies springing up that are trying to develop this technology for a number of, of uh, disorders, and the speed at which this field is moving is really uh, breathtaking. So we can take cells, I've told you, from patients with DMD, and we can, if I receive letters almost every day from patients around the world telling me what their mutation is, and if it's a, a mutation that we haven't worked on, we can get a small blood sample from uh, that patient and we can test whether we can correct it or we can use gene editing technology just to create that mutation in cells uh, in our laboratory and then see if we can correct it. And I've shown you that we can uh, now do that through myo-editing. We tra we've translated this effectively into mice by delivery of gene editing components in a harmless virus into humanized mice that harbor the same mutation seen in boys. And we're now approaching the final hurdle, which is a big one, and that is to scale up to go from a mouse uh, into a boy, and we're preparing to do studies in uh, dogs with Duchenne to see whether we can make this work, we believe we can, as well as safety studies uh, in non-human primates as a prelude for eventually translating this uh, into the many patients that would benefit from it. So our work is done at UT Southwestern, here's our building there, and we're uh, supported in part by the UT Southwestern uh, Wellstone Muscular Dystrophy Research Center. Here's my laboratory. There's about 40 scientists from all over the world uh, that uh, come to our laboratory to work on these and related projects. I'm always happy to uh, hear from people and tell you where we are with this work. Here's my email if you want, anybody wants to contact us. And uh, Leonella Amawasi, she's a postdoctoral fellow from France. She's in the back of the room. She did all the work on the viral delivery of gene editing components to rescue the humanized mice. And Rhonda basil is in the back of the room. She's my longtime colleague, and she'll handle all the hard questions that you might have. Well, thank you uh, all uh, very much for your interest in our work, and please stay in touch if I can provide you any further information. <laughs>